women all over the world. In the opening pages of your new book, you tell about returning to your old love, teaching at Georgetown University. And I admire your wisdom in making this choice, and I envy the students you teach. You write about religion and politics, and Islam and the West. I was struck by a quote Adams, America's second president and our namesake, when he said, liberty is a gift from God, democracy is a, democracy is a creation of man. It's fascinating to realize how current his words still are in today's social and political debates. It's great that you bring up these issues in your book and inspire people to think deeper and work towards a better world. I would like to introduce now our moderator for this evening, Chris Keine, who is a journalist for Vapor Radio and Television and who is highly regarded for his interviews with Salman Rusty and Francis Fukuyama. I would also like to introduce our former Secretary of State and a personal friend, Mr. Josias van Aertsen, who will speak at the end of the evening. We are very thankful who has made this evening possible. Uh, I would also like to thank the city of Amsterdam for the generous support, as well as from Dithmar Book Importers and the Renaissance Hotel. Evenings like these are only possible because of our generous sponsors and our dedicated volunteers. If you would like to become a sponsor or a volunteer in any way, please feel free to speak to me or any of our board members present here tonight. Finally, I would like to mention that Secretary Albright, hope you enjoyed this evening. Chris, maybe you can step up. I definitely don't need that. <clears throat> ah, good evening. Our distinguished guest of tonight, Madam Secretary, Secretary Mrs. Madeleine Albright, is, among many other things, uh, a former American ambassador to the United Nations and the first woman ever to become Secretary of State of the United States of America, as I'm sure many people around the world will remember for different reasons. Three years ago, she published her memoir. The Dutch translation counted 514 pages, and I can assure you they are in very fine print. So one thing is sure, Mrs. Madeleine Albright is someone remarkably able to restrain herself. One mustn't think of the number of trees it would have cost when she would have written down everything. Because that life that started on the 15th of May, 1937, in a hospital in the Prague neighborhood Smichov, already in its first 10 years took two turns so dramatic that a full account of the events could have taken half this book. The first one being the flight with her diplomat parents to London after the Wehrmacht marched into Prague in 39, as a consequence of the treason of Munich one year earlier. The second time, in 47, the family left Prague for America after the Soviet-supported putsch of the communists, a move that would turn out to be a definitive swap of homelands. Barely 10 years old and, as we say in Dutch, bitten by the cat and the dog, hit from the left and from the right. If that doesn't turn you into a liberal democrat, I wouldn't know what does. So the rest of Madeleine Albright's life is marked by these quote-unquote soft aims of human rights and democracy, although one immediately has to add that they were not always strived for with soft measures. Because the career she built in her new homeland knew enough dramatic turns that would have, would have cost us an extra Swedish forest if she had accounted for them in the fullness they deserve especially because the striving for these soft aims often took hard decisions and tough measures. Not so much in her academic career, which culminated in a professorate in international affairs at Georgetown University, a position, as Corinna just said, Madeleine Albright holds again as we speak, but very much so in her many political activities. Starting from her campaigning assistance for different democratic presidential candidates, Muskie, Mondale, Dukakis, 
but of course more so when she was part of the executive branch. In the 70s, as an aide to National Security Advisor Brzezinski under President Jimmy Carter, and mostly in the 1990s in the aforementioned positions she held during the Clinton administration. Probably to her own regret, she was not yet in one of those positions when one of the biggest events of current history, the bafflingly rapid crumbling of the Eastern Bloc and the ousting of the regime that had first driven her and her family out of Czechoslovakia took place. But her later work offered her, among other satisfying things, a lifelong friendship with the icon of Eastern Europe dissidency and the Velvet Revolution, former Czech President Václav Havel. What a triumph. But just imagine yourself, if you can at all, as Secretary of State in this historical period. Somalia, Rwanda, Yugoslavia, Iraq, Kosovo. Not to speak of the minor details and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which unfortunately is not much confined to historical periods within the span of human life. To give you an example of one of the hard decisions and tough measures Madeleine Albright had to take, if it would have been for her, the American military involvement in the war in Bosnia would never have been what it has been in its crucial impact. A fact, by the way, that we Europeans should still be ashamed of. And when Slobodan Milosevic tried to play the same trick a few, a few years later in Kosovo, once more, it was Madeleine Albright who convinced her own government and its European allies that they should intervene. But with rockets, bombs, and shells at the possible cost of innocent life and not by the soft hand of diplomacy. One Munich was enough to Madeleine Albright's taste. So, political drama abound, and personal too. This middle European girl, in the midst of the hard work of growing up, that had to turn herself into an American. A divorce gruesome enough by itself, but all the more so in her case, because it shook the belief in what she set out to prove, maybe before everything else in her life, that it was possible to com combine being a dedicated wife and mother with having a meaningful public career. But in all these 514 pages of highly meaningful events and dramatic turns, there's one that surpasses everything. On the morning of the day Madeleine Albright formally took office as the first woman to be Secretary of State of the United States of America, the Washington Post carried the story that, much to Madeleine Albright's own bewilderment, she was not a Roman Catholic, as she was always led to believe, but Jewish, and that three of her grandparents and a cousin had been murdered in a Nazi camp. It may be because of that personal history which emphasized the importance of religious identity with such violent impact at so late a stage in her life, that Madeleine Albright is the person to teach us that religion inevitably has to be a part of politics, and of foreign politics for that matter. It's exactly that daring thesis that Madeleine Albright explores in her new book, The Mighty and the Almighty, Reflections on America, God, and World Affairs. It's also that book and that thesis that will be the topic of our gathering here tonight. Please welcome Madam Secretary, Mrs. Madeleine Albright. We are a little bit different height. Uh, Thank you very much, Chris Kane, for that uh, really great introduction. Uh, and I hope I can live up to it because of it so uh, elegant and uh, had so many aspects raised. And Corinne, thank you very much for your very kind welcome and invitation. Uh, Michelle Bond, our Consul General here, who has been somebody I've known a long time and first met in Czechoslovakia when that was one country and Jorge Van Artsen, one of my very, very close friends and colleagues through many of the issues that Chris discussed. Without uh, Foreign Minister Van Artsen's uh, great partnership, we would not have been able to do what we did, which was to end ethnic cleansing in Kosovo. And he is now a member of my very illustrious group of former foreign ministers. Uh, 
Madeline and the X-Men's. Uh, and it, it grows by its uh, very definition, and our latest member is Yoshka Fisher. So uh, anyway, Yoshka, thanks very much for being here. Three years ago, when I was here to talk about my memoir, I said I was honored to participate in this lecture series, and it's doubly gratifying to be asked for a return visit to a place where everyone agrees that great minds meet. When not traveling, I'm usually in Washington, D.C., where the great minds are considerably outnumbered by the big mouths. Uh, so <clears throat> this is a real treat, and I really thank you all for inviting me. When I was here in 2003, I began by praising the Netherlands for its exemplary record as an international citizen, both historically and in the modern era. And I will not repeat that praise except to observe that Netherlands is currently providing NATO with its Secretary General, the UN with its Special Envoys for Sudan and the Western Sahara, the International Criminal Court with its home, and the developing world with a generous, uh, as generous a level of aid in fighting poverty and disease as any other country. Dutch troops have also been deeply engaged in the effort to help the people of Afghanistan and Iraq to find security and a better life. So I congratulate all of you. And many countries are content to lecture others about responsibilities. The Dutch don't lecture, you act, and the world is better for it. As you know, I'm here tonight to talk about my second book, uh, which, just to keep repeating, is called The Mighty and the Almighty. Um, and it's been very interesting in thinking whether the translation of that really works, but it, is, uh, it works in the United States, and yours just actually told me that it works here. So, The timing couldn't be better, because given the upsurge in appeals to a higher power that Europe has experienced these past few days, to some, the prayers are evidence of a profound spiritual awakening. To the more skeptical, they are due entirely to the beginning of the World Cup. Uh, and I'm told that even Dutch atheists pray for Robin, just in case. Um, uh, I should be clear that in my book, I, I don't pretend to offer any new or startling insights about religion. I'm neither a theologian nor, quite frankly, uh, well enough behaved to lecture others about the nature and habits of God. It is true that when I was a little girl, I had fantasies about becoming a priest. And to understand how ambitious this was, you do have to remember that I was raised a Roman Catholic. But my memoir was easier for me to explain than the second book because the memoir was all about me, a subject that I knew better than anybody else. Um, I don't know more about religion and morality than anybody else. I do, however, have something, know something about world affairs. And it's from that perspective, as a policymaker, and a problem solver that I present my arguments. Still, this is not a book that I really ever expected to write. I am part of a generation that was taught to keep religion as separate as possible from foreign policy. In fact, when I told some of my former European colleagues that I was writing this book, they looked at me as if I had lost my mind. The goal of a diplomat, after all, is to keep people settled down. Religion has a tendency to stir everyone up. And it's hard enough to resolve a dispute over land and resources. It can become impossible when one side or another is arguing its case, not on the basis of simple fairness, but because they are convinced that their own interests and God's will be identical. I have often thought that history would be much different if people did not seem to hear God most clearly when he is telling them exactly what they want to hear. The truth is that people have been making each other miserable in the name of religion since the dawn of time. In the most distant past, the worshipers of fish gods waged war with the followers of the frog gods. In the Middle Ages, Christian crusaders turned Jerusalem into a sea of blood. In our time, child soldiers in Africa have been kidnapped, drugged, and thrown into battle, having been assured that a heavenly power would make them invisible and therefore invulnerable. And over the past few years, we have seen men fly airplanes into buildings, blow up trains, and assassinate political and cultural figures 
all to please a supposedly merciful and compassionate God. It should not be surprising, then, that I chose to begin one chapter of my book with the following quotation from John Adams. This would be the best of all possible worlds, he wrote, if there were no religion in it. But Adams was of two minds, for he immediately went on to say that without religion, this world would be hell. Like many thoughtful people then and now, Adams was conscious both of, the, of religion's immense capacity to divide and of its power to inspire compassion, comfort, and courage. He had little use for Christian theology, but great respect for the God of nature. Adams also knew that the impact of religion on world affairs could not be ignored. In his day, religion was a factor in the conflict between Western sea traders and the rulers of North Africa's Barbary states. In our era, religion and globalization have combined to generate new waves on an already turbulent globe. In Latin America, Protestant evangelicals are challenging the centuries-old dominance of the Catholic Church. In China, authorities are struggling to prevent popular religious movements from evolving into political threats. In Arab countries, secular nationalism is being overwhelmed by an Islamic revival. In Israel, religious parties are opposing plans to consolidate Jewish settlements in the West Bank. In Africa, both Islam and Christianity are spreading rapidly in what some have called a race for souls. In America, politicians often invoke God to enhance their own popularity and power, thereby reducing religion to self-righteousness and confusing morality with bigotry. And here in Europe, the integration of immigrants from Muslim states has become a matter for impassioned debate with allegations of extremism and discrimination being tossed back and forth, creating more heat than light. The challenge for our leaders is to manage events in a world in which there are many religions with beliefs that flatly contradict one another at key points. This test extends back to pagan times and is therefore nothing new. What is new is the extent of damage disagreements can inflict. This is where the march of technology has truly made a difference. A religious war fought with clubs and battering rams is one thing. A war fought with high explosives against civilian targets is quite another. And the prospect of a nuclear bomb employed by terrorists in alleged service to the Almighty is a nightmare that may one day come true. So especially after 9-11, we have to find a way to make religion a force for reconciliation. The question is how to do this. A friend of mine has compared that job to brain surgery, necessary to do but disastrous if you slip up. The Times demands skilled and credible leaders who will decisively rebut the likes of Osama bin Laden and bring people together across the boundaries of nationality, race, and creed. And I worry that the world does not have enough leaders such as that today. After 9-11, President Bush tried to draw a line across the globe, separating law-abiding people from terrorists. This was the right goal. The problem is that he soon lost sight of his own objective. Instead of keeping the world focused on what the terrorists had done, his triumphalist rhetoric made people worry about what America might do. Instead of finishing the job in Afghanistan, he invaded Iraq. And instead of using diplomacy to develop a widely agreed plan for collective action, he ignored the advice of others and went it alone. According to a Greek proverb, it is better to let an evil stay where it is than to disturb it with the wrong remedies. I fear the truth of that proverb may be demonstrated with Saddam Hussein and Iraq. When I was in government, I knew from UN inspections and other sources that Hussein might possess chemical and biological arms. I also knew that he lacked the means to deploy such weapons beyond his nation's borders. His armed forces were prohibited from flying or even driving through much of the country. What is more, they were surrounded. 
Saddam Hussein was a wolf, but he was cut off, unable to get to the chicken coop, or at least that was my understanding. But after I left office, we began to hear about some new information. Suddenly we were told that Iraq was developing nuclear arms and that it had a fleet of biological weapons laboratories roaming around the country. This was news to me, but it was the kind of threat that was used to justify the war. Only later did we learn that the weapons did not exist. They were lies fed to the West by an Iraqi exile with the rather peculiar code name of Curveball. The exile wanted to prod America and its closest allies into invading, and he succeeded. And for the last three years, our troops have been living with the consequences. Saddam Hussein is in prison, and that is indeed good. But thousands of coalition troops have been killed or wounded. Anti-Western feelings have increased. A new magnet for terrorism has been created and the prospects for a peaceful and democratic Iraq remain very much in doubt. So how did this happen? The answer is that U.S. officials failed to take into account the impact that religion and history would have on Iraqi perceptions. This was a serious error. After all, Iraq had been invaded before, by Persia in ancient times, by the Ottomans in medieval times, and by the British at the height of the colonial era. The possibility that another invasion would be resented and resisted should not have come as a surprise, especially when the occupying force was predominantly Christian. What is more, the fact that Iraqi people were sharply divided along ethnic and religious lines created obvious risks. The war has altered the balance of power between the Sunni and Shiite Muslims that had existed for roughly 1,000 years and it has dramatically increased the regional influence of Iran, whose government may be the only clear winner in this war. Although U.S. policy has suffered numerous setbacks in Iraq, the Bush administration still talks about its plan for victory. Most of us would settle for an Iraq that is in one piece, has legitimate leadership, and is able to provide security for its people. The coalition can neither impose nor accomplish that. But a satisfactory outcome is still possible if Iraq's government can persuade the more pragmatic power brokers from all factions that they have to work together, not because they want to, but because the alternatives for every side are so much worse. Whatever happens in Iraq, the larger battle against international terrorists will remain. I stress in my book the importance of being clear about who and what we are fighting. This is complicated because the enemy has no central government, flies no flag, and wears no uniforms. The terror networks are loosely organized and geographically scattered. They operate under many names, and their members are hard to identify or quantify. We do know that they are supported financially and intellectually by extremist clerics who justify violence and openly glorify terrorist acts. This support for terror by people who call themselves Muslims has caused some to indict the religion itself. That is both unfair and dangerous. Adolf Hitler portrayed himself as a Christian, yet there is nothing Christian about Nazism. Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin was assassinated by an ultra-Orthodox Jew, but that murder had nothing in common with Judaism. The killers of 9-11 and subsequent attacks may be Muslims, but they are an abomination to Islam. The truth is that many who claim to act out of religious conviction do not understand what their religion really demands. In the chapter in my book that deals specifically with Europe, I write, and I quote myself, it is frustrating to authorities that terror suspects do not fit neatly into any demographic profile. If there is a pattern, it is that recruits experience a sharp change in attitude toward religion. This happens through exposure to clerics who do not teach real Islam, but rather a version distorted by politics and out of context quotations from the Quran. Young Muslims looking for something meaningful to care about may be fooled into thinking they have found it in the call to holy war. Then they are born again terrorists. Unquote. So how do we stop people from making this kind of a choice? 
The answer is we have to win the battle of ideas. We cannot expect those who see themselves as defenders of Islam to abandon that self-image. We can, however, hope to persuade more of them that attacking the innocent on buses, trains, and planes is not the way to honor their faith. This should be a hard message, uh, this should not be a hard message to put across. Killing civilians, children, and fellow Muslims in the name of Islam is as rich a blend of hypocrisy and heresy as one could imagine. Muslim leaders everywhere owe it to themselves and to us all to underline this message in everything they do and say. What is frustrating is that the clarity of this lesson has been blurred by self-destructive U.S. policies and actions as the prolonged detentions at Guantanamo, the abuses at Abu Ghraib, the apparent murders at Haditha, and the Bush administration's waffling on torture. These mistakes have been incredibly harmful and will be expiated only if the administration accepts responsibility not at the bottom of the chain of command, but at the top. For two years, pamphlets have circulated in Arab communities showing the photos from Abu Ghraib and asking the question, where are the men who will avenge our dignity? In a region of long memories, I fear those images will be fueling anti-Western violence for generations to come. In the poem by William Butler Yeats, it is, when, it is said that it is when the best lack all conviction and the worst are full of passionate intensity that things fall apart, the center cannot hold, and anarchy is loosed upon the world. We live at a time when the worst are indeed full of passionate inten intensity. The question is whether the rest of us have the courage of our conviction and the wisdom to make the right choices. In my book, I outline what some of these right choices might be. These include, first, a renewed effort to find common ground in the Middle East, understanding that Muslims, Christians, and Jews are all children of Abraham, and that there are better ways to honor a holy land than by irrigating it with blood. Second, we should agree that there is no acceptable excuse for terror, and that every government has an obligation to refrain from indiscriminate violence. These norms apply not to some, but to all. They should govern forces acting in self-defense as well as aggressors, democracies as well as dictatorships, and militias as well as regular armies. They must apply as well to those who believe in their hearts that they are doing the work of God. Holy intentions do not excuse evil actions. Third, we should promote democratic principles and institutions around the world, including the Arab Middle East. This is despite the recent gains by Islamist parliamentary candidates in Egypt and the victory of Hamas in the Palestinian elections. We must remember that the alternative to support for democracy is embracing governments that lack the blessing of their own people. And that leads not to stability, but to its counterfeit, leaving a shackle to dictators at odds with Arab Democrats Distrust, distrusted by Arab populations and unsure of ourselves. At the same time, we should keep a rein on our expectations. Just because the denial of freedom is bad doesn't mean the exercise of freedom will always be to our liking. Democracy is a form of government, not a ticket to some heavenly kingdom where extremism is vanquished and everyone agrees with us. If Arab democracy develops, it will be to advance Arab aspirations based on Arab perceptions of history and justice. The right to vote and hold office is unlikely to soften Arab attitudes towards Israel or to end the potential for terror, just as it has not stopped terrorist cells from organizing in the West. Democracy should, however, create a broader and more open political debate within Arab countries, exposing myths to scrutiny and dangerous ideas to rebuttal. Though some may fear such an opening, the Western democracies should welcome it. For if we fail to value free expression, we forget our own history. Fourth, we should do all we can to defeat the axis of evil, poverty, ignorance, and disease. 
In so doing, we should assemble the broadest conceivable coalition. After all, if Jesse Helms and Bono can agree on fighting HIV aid, miracles are indeed possible. <laughs> Fifth, we should understand and accept that none of us has full possession of the truth. Especially when it comes to religion, we may feel that our beliefs are superior to others, but we must, if we are honest, also accept that there are mysteries we do not know and realities we only dimly comprehend. Although our religions may divide us, this lack of complete knowledge unites us. We are all part of humanity and have been given no license to disrespect or abuse one another. I say in the closing pages of my book that it is human instinct to organize into groups. For most of us, this sorting process is largely passive. The groups to which we belong are part of our inheritance and culture, a consequence of where we were born and how we were raised. Uh, and I use my own story in this. As has been mentioned, I was raised a Roman Catholic. I married an Episcopalian and found out I was Jewish. Uh, so if as a child I had been sent to a synagogue instead of a church, I would have grown to adulthood with a different group identity. Uh, as has also been mentioned, I was born in Czechoslovakia. If it had not been for the Cold War, I would not uh, have been with my parents when they asked for political asylum in the United States, and I might now be teaching history at Charles University. Nature allows us to choose neither our parents nor our place of birth, limiting from the outset the groups with which we will forever after identify. It is true that some of us will weigh competing philosophies and convert from one religion to another out of spiritual and emotional conviction. Some of us may find reason to shift our allegiance from one country to another. More often, however, we remain within the same general categories we dropped into at birth, or as in my case, where events beyond our control have placed us. That's not much of an accomplishment. It is fine to be proud of the groups to which we belong, but it should not be that hard for us to imagine ourselves in the shoes of somebody else. Back in the 16th century, a great son of the Netherlands, Erasmus, had the temerity to ask whether there was a more Christian way to deal with the Turks than to kill as many as possible. He predicted accurately that by merely asking that question, he would be accused by some of advocating pacifism in the face of enemy attacks. What he was really saying is that the most important battles cannot be won solely with the sword and shield, and that ultimately we will be defined less by whom we are against than by what we are for. And this leads to my final choice, both in the book and in my opening remarks to you this evening, which is that we should embrace the principle that every life matters and that every individual counts. Respect for the dignity of every human being is the place where religious faith and faith in political liberty have their closest connection. A philosophy that begins with that principle has a huge advantage when matched against the propaganda of those who see God's commandment as, thou shalt kill. It challenges the legitimacy of dictators and tyrants who claim virtual divinity for themselves. It provides a basis for unity across every border, and it enables us to gain from the contributions of all people. It reflects our highest ideals, and it is in keeping with the fundamental basis of our kinship with one another that each of us was made, albeit in a sense we may not fully understand, in the image of God. Thank you all very much, and I now look forward to our discussion. Thank you very much, Madam Secretary. Um, we'll take a shot at it first, and then we'll give okay, the audience great. a chance to shoot next. Um, in your book, and you stipulated that uh, again now, you describe how you grew up and were educated as a specialist in international affairs in the conviction that politics, and especially foreign politics, are uh, in the realm of ratio and pragmatism, uh, and that the almighty, if not slowly driven away from the public domain, uh, at all, had no business in international affairs. Now, 
you made one thing clear that you had to retreat in your tracks in uh, in recent years in that opinion i wondered what's happened have we been deaf and blind for the last 50 years or did the world change dramatically well i think that the world has changed dramatically and that um i think the cold war in many ways froze a lot of issues and we were concerned with other aspects of ideology and clearly uh, religion uh, has always been there uh, for many people, but it has had a resurgence, uh, especially as ethnic conflicts in a variety of places and border conflicts have uh, come more into um, view. But the question that I asked myself was, um, I have to admit that when I started this book, I had one particular, I had many hypotheses, but one that I had was that George Bush was an anomaly in American history uh, in terms of his great religious beliefs. So I went back and uh, I had studied American history many times. Um, and um, you know, in America you study it at various phases in education. And, uh, and I believed very much everything about the American dream and manifest destiny, but as I went through, I could see that every American president has invoked God in some form or another, uh, including President McKinley, who, for instance, at the end of the 19th century thought it was America's duty to Christianize the Philippines, even though they were Catholic. Um, and um, so this, in that way, George Bush God is... God may not have noticed well, <laughs> that time. George Bush is not different. Where he is different is in the terms of the certitude of his belief. And the question is where that comes from and what the um, counter aspect to that is and the certitude of the belief of certain uh, people in other religions. And uh, one of the hardest times I've had with this book is finding the labels, so I'm trying to be careful. But um, I think that extremists in all the religions have in fact raised um, the visibility of religion in politics, and therefore there has been some difference. Uh, so talking about this visibility, was there so much as a, a, a Paul's moment for you? What was, what was the epiphanic moment when you saw that religion was definitely back? Well, I, I can tell you, it came upon, there was not kind of a eureka moment, but um, <laughs> there was a slow aspect even as I was secretary, and I mentioned the Middle East. Um, President Clinton and I spent a great deal of time on the Middle East, and um, and I think that it was became clearer and clearer that if Jerusalem was just an issue of real estate, we could have dealt with it a long time ago. But as I alluded to in my remarks, because both parties believe that God gave them that piece of land, there is more. Uh, there's another presence in the room. So Camp David in the summer of 2000 for me became a very important moment and we made a mistake because we had not taken religion into consideration enough. And there are a lot of people who think we went to Camp David because President Clinton wanted a legacy. That's not why we went there. We went there because Prime Minister Barack had some very bold and interesting ideas and wanted to use the end of President Clinton's presidency uh, to move the process forward. But, uh, and Chairman Arafat did not want to come to Camp David at all, so I had to persuade him. And while Prime Minister Barack had very bold ideas, he also was very secretive. And so he did not tell us his bottom lines until we got there. And so one of the problems was Pr Chairman Arafat could certainly make decisions about the size of the Palestinian state. He had been elected president, but he did not have the right solely to make decision about the disposition of the holy places. Um, we began to talk about some new concept, which was divine sovereignty for the holy places, but the people that had, uh, were also responsible were the Saudis, the Moroccans, other Arabs that had responsibility, and we should have had them there. Mm -hmm. So that was one thing that I made was clear to me. Yeah. And then Sudan, uh, when it was a north-south issue. I was visited by a group of children from a Christian school in the United States, and they all of a sudden knew more about Sudan than most people. And so it, it linked for me the interest in the growth of religion in the United States with the possibility of humanitarian action abroad. So those were kind of the slow aspects of yeah. it. And, um 
Are you glad that the Almighty is back in the public domain? Uh, one has to be glad that the Almighty is back. <laughs> the problem is the title of my book, The Mighty and the Almighty. Uh, and I think that the thing that troubles me the most, and um, I know it's not absolutely correct for a former government official to criticize the current president of the United States in a foreign country, but I have written a book, so I can't talk about one thing one place. And they're, and not, they're not something here. There. Uh, <laughs> but what troubles me the most is that there has been a linkage um, by President Bush. First of all, I have a quote in my book that says, God wants me to be president. And second, that God is on America's side. And I much prefer what President Lincoln said, which is that we have to be on God's side. And so by linking the Almighty with the mighty, uh, I think President Bush has made it much more difficult for countries to support us in a number of activities. It's one thing when he united us all, including uh, Europeans and others in the world after 9-11, because he made the choice very simple. It was the people who fly airplanes into buildings and kill innocent people versus those who uh, don't do that. But when the choice comes to the fact that God is on our side, which means you have to accept the war in Iraq and Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo uh, and the uh, use of force uh, and the belief that the United States can do whatever it wants to, then I think it undermines it. So it's the linkage of the mighty and the almighty that I'm worried about. Yeah. I'd, I'd like to, to take one step back before we, we talk about religion. Uh, as you do in your book, you, uh, you speak uh, about morality in, in foreign politics. And, um, you mention uh, the quote by Martin Luther King, uh, who urges politicians to do what is right in, in a context of conscience. Uh, but even that, foreign politics and morality seems an uneasy marriage. What, what has been the heaviest collision between national interests and, and moral categories in your career? Well, I think there are two different aspects of this. I have always had a very hard time as a student of foreign policy and a practitioner of dealing with what I think is an artificial divide between the realists and the idealists. The idealists, theoretically, the ones with more moral foreign policies. And I have to admit that partially it's because I, don't, I can't put myself in either category, so what I say is I'm a realistic idealist or an idealistic realist. Um, and I do believe that a country such as the United States needs to have a moral foreign policy meaning that we abide by certain values that we think are intrinsic to our country uh, or and other countries have values of freedom of speech and respect for the individual and the rule of law. Um, but I think sometimes it is very hard, I have to admit this, to be consistent. Mm -hmm. uh, because there are national interests where you find that you have to deal with less than attractive um, governments and uh, their leaders because you have some national interest issues. But in the long run, I think our country, your country, is better off if in fact we have a set of values that guide us. You can have values that guide you without always being able to live up to them, but if they are there, then I think it helps set a direction. Yeah. Is there also a risk uh, in using moral categories in foreign policy to the extent that, for instance, not, not few people in the world uh, hold the belief that the war in Iraq is not as much about freedom and democracy as about oil, that moral categories can, can use as a cover for other interests? Well, I think that, first of all, I don't believe it's about oil. It may be about other things, but I don't think it's about oil. Um, or wasn't. Um, I think that um, the issue here is, and, and maybe this becomes semantic, but I believe that the U.S. can abide by a moral foreign policy without being moralistic, which is lecturing everybody else about it, uh, and then using it as a cover for other things. I, I think, I have to say this, that I have read many, many books and listened to many, many commentators but I do not know the real reason for going into Iraq. You said it was not about oil uh, until now? Well, you, I don't know. Now oil and the resource um, competition 
is more than ever because mm -hmm. I think that it becomes clearer as new countries come online with growing economies such as China and India that there is growing competition for resources. But um, one of the things, uh, I am an optimistic American, not a cynical European, so uh, I uh, do not think it started about oil. And I'm only a journalist. <laughs> Um, the, the next step, uh, yeah. as was clear from, from uh, your speech now, when you close the chapter about morality, uh, is that you ask yourself if we need more conscious in, in uh, foreign policy, which we do, do we need more religion? And uh, although that question at that stage of the book is still full of doubt, you, you uh, conclude very affirmatively. Um, what exactly do you mean there? Do you mean only knowledge and being conscious of religious factors in certain situations in international affairs as an analytical tool? Or, or do you mean religiosity itself as a tool in foreign politics? No, I, I, I have to repeat something that I have said often, and I said it in this speech. I am not a theologian, and I haven't turned into a religious mystic. Uh, I am a problem solver. And while this might offend um, people that truly are members of any church, I in many ways see it as a tool for solving problems, which means being analytical about what role religion plays, uh, what our diplomats can do. I happen, one of the things I recommend in my book is that our diplomats be trained to know the religious basis of the countries they're going to. Uh, I recommend that the Secretary of State have religious advisors. I had advisors on arms control when I went, I understood the general aspect of the uh, anti-ballistic missile treaty. I didn't know every detail of the trajectories or the targeting, so I had um, uh, experts. I certainly knew the importance of trade issues. Did I know every detail of intellectual property rights? No, so when we negotiated with the Chinese, I had um, lawyers and economic experts or environmental experts. So I did have one religious advisor. I think the Secretary of State should have religious advisors. Hmm. I also think that we should use religious leaders in conflict resolution. Initially, in order to try to bring people together, I found very interesting the role of the Vatican, the St. Egidio process in Mozambique and in Bosnia. Uh, and I also think that while I would not invite religious leaders to the negotiating table at a time, they certainly can be a resource. And finally, they can be validators for whatever decision is made. So it's not the religiosity, it is the idea of understanding religion and not, you know, I mean, simple things also like knowing not to launch a great battle on the eve of an anniversary of a martyr's birth or death. That doesn't seem to take a lot of intelligence. So. It's that kind of thing to, to truly understand the basis of what, uh, how important religion is in a country. Yeah. Um, now, we, we can't go through the whole world in 30 minutes, but I'd, I'd like to go through some hotspots with you. You, you mentioned them uh, in your speech, and uh, uh, probably also because in your book you say there are two conditions determining uh, the world's course for the good or the bad in, in the near future, which is... Uh, a resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and the result of the war in Iraq. Now, as, as you said, you've been working on settlements in, in the Middle East on different occasions. Um, if you would have realized the, the impact of religion in, in Jerusalem, uh, which is probably the most religiously burdened place in the world, uh, what would you have done differently? apart from inviting the Saudis and the Moroccans to, to talk? Well, I think um, I don't have an answer. If I did, I might have some other venue. <laughs> might be back uh, in office. But, uh, <laughs> but I think the following thing is true, is that uh, we did begin to look at a particular issue. Jerusalem is interesting because it can be described as kind of being in four concentric circles, with the smallest circle being the holy places. I don't know how many people here have been to Jerusalem, but I find it a, a place, the first time I went, um, you first get go to Jerusalem and everybody's talking about God and so you think, definitely there is God. But then you go, for instance, to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which is a Christian church, 
And I describe this, you are told to put your hand in a hole which was supposed to have been the base of the cross uh, that Christ was crucified on. And then you look down and the whole place is made up of squares that belong to different sects of Christian religion. And you think, what God would want this activity? Then you go at the stage that I was there past the Wailing Wall and there were no women. Uh, and then you go up the hill to a quiet place, which is the, the Muslim part. But there's a sign that says something like, any Jew coming up here will be, um, uh, I can't remember the exact word, but not nice. Anyway, so, uh, <laughs> but you think, why did God, why does this happen? Mm. And then when we were, spent so much time on the technical aspects of Jerusalem, that small holy place, everything is built on top of everything else. And the question that we had was, who has control over the top, the Muslim part, and who has control over what was supposed to be the Temple of Solomon and the Wailing Wall as part of the Western Wall. Temple and Square. the Jews want to have control of that. So we began, that's when we started talking about divine sovereignty, which meant that ultimately it could be and should and maybe could be run according to rules by the United Nations, an international access place. I, I think that is one thing that, that I would recommend. The problem, however, goes, I think, to the basic issue that I raised is respect for the individual and not uh, demonizing uh, the other side. Hmm. But technically and practically what it takes at this point is active involvement by the United States to try to get negotiations going again. Um, and uh, I think that too much time was wasted by not having any negotiations the last five years. While we were negotiating, um, a quarter, the exact numbers are, I think, four times more Israelis and Palestinians have died. And, and, who, and who would we talk to, to uh, the democratically elected Hamas government? I think government? a mistake that was made was not to be supportive enough of, prime, of Mahmoud Abbas. Uh, who would we talk to, to uh, the democratically elected Hamas government? I think government? a mistake that was made was not to be supportive enough of, prime, of Mahmoud Abbas. Uh, when he was first there uh, to, to give him a sense of confidence. We're in a difficult position now. Because who do we talk to at this stage? Well, I still would talk to Abbas. Uh, but I think that there has to be a way to, to try to get the talks together in some uh, behind the scenes. And this, I think, is also a place for business people can help, uh, religious leaders can help, but it, we are in a very bad situation. But we have to pay attention. Yeah. The other determining uh, factor, uh, you mentioned Iraq, you, you said a lot about it. Uh, the House yesterday adopted a resolution that, that basically says stay the course and um, that doesn't give a deadline for American presence in, in Iraq. Uh, 90 Republican representatives voted for the resolution, 75 of uh, your party members voted against. What would you have voted? Uh, I, I, I don't know. It's a lucky thing I'm not an elected official. Uh, no, I'll tell you where I am. This is why I think this is a very hard issue. I think the U.S. has to leave Iraq. Uh, our presence is both the problem and the solution. Um, but I am not for a date certain uh, because we made a mistake in Bosnia. We said we would be out in a year and we couldn't uh, make it in a year, so we lost our credibility. So I think that this should be the year of transition. But, and this is the big but, and you may be surprised about what I'm about to say. The United States did not start World War I or World War II. But when we saw that what was happening on this continent not only affected the people here, your national interests, but American national interests, the U.S. came in. Uh, all, many of you, uh, not so, in this country and in others, did not agree with the Iraq War. But I think, and, and usually when you write a book, you hope that everything you say will come true. Mm. I wrote that I think Iraq may very well be the greatest disaster in American foreign policy. I hope I'm wrong. But if it is, and things are spinning out of control the way they are now, they not only affect the people of Iraq and the region and the U.S., but they affect you all. And I think the Europeans need to be more active in terms of training, helping in the training, 
uh, of the Iraqi police and the Iraqi militia. The Americans have to share the contracts and people have to be on the ground providing reconstruction effort and living up to their pledges so that the new prime minister who is elected uh, can have some credibility and we can get out of there and make clear that the U.S. is not an occupying power and has no intention of having permanent bases. So I think that, uh, I think we should leave, uh, but I think we all want to support our troops uh, and this is a very strong debate in the Democratic Party because there's disagreement uh, on whether there should be a deadline or whether we should be seeing 2006 as a debate. Yeah. I see some of our politicians taking notes, so you might be surprised. Um, you extensively speak about uh, the relationship between defending democracy and, uh, and fighting terrorism, terrorism in Europe, and you, you spoke about it in your speech now too. Uh, mentioning measures in Holland and England, for instance, the possibility to silence or even expel uh, radical imams. Now, you didn't say it, but I had the impression that without saying it, you, you wanted to tell us that we cross a line there. Well, I think that um, one of the hardest parts, and as I have just said, lecturing other people is not what we should be doing, but uh, I, I think that um, there has to be a better sense of how uh, Muslim populations are absorbed within um, Western Europe. Uh, what needs to happen, I think, is there need to be statements from within the Islamic community itself about what to do about the radical uh, imams. Because one of the things that happens is the minute somebody from the other religion says something, kind of a defensive line, uh, goes up. And I find a very interesting proposal that uh, I put in my book that was made by the Grand Mufti of Sarajevo, Mr. Tsevich, who says that it's almost as if there needs to be some new contra social contract or bargain that the Muslims who live within uh, all your borders, either as citizens or as um, refugees, they have to agree to participate in the laws of this country. And at the same time, the powers that be in a country, as well as its citizens, need to recognize the amount of influence that the Islamic culture has had on everybody's history in Europe, because after all, a lot of Europe was part of the Ottoman Empire, and to recognize something new, which is a Judeo-Christian Islamic tradition, whereby the moderates, and that again is a hard definition, would have influence on the radicals within their own religion so that it does not become a clash of religions. And in that respect, what do you think of the measures and the debate as you know, as you know them uh, being, being conducted and being taken at the moment in Holland, for instance? Well, um, it's not a good idea to get involved in the domestic politics of another country. Uh, I, am I thought it was a good idea to ask. enough <laughs> problems uh, in my own country. Um, and um, so I, I do think, I have always thought of Holland as a very reasoned country and one that likes dialogue. And I think there should be a debate. Um, I think that those of us that are watching what is happening in the Netherlands now, um, are surprised, frankly, um, and troubled because we have always seen this as a very fair um, and um, open and liberal society. So I understand the trauma that is being caused and I trust the good sense of the Dutch to resolve this well. Thank you very much. Um, your final plea, apart from, as you said, the, the respect for the individual, your final plea, one of the final pleas in, in, in uh, the seven recommendations for courses of action to take, you, you, you do in your book, is for better knowledge of one's own and of the other's religion and for better understanding between religions. Now, you, you're not the first with such a plea and, as it seems at the moment, uh, n n not too much effect. You also point yourself at the fact that many good-willing projects in that sphere merely are uh, preaching for a parish already converted. So how do we go about reaching that goal, a better understanding among religions? Well, I think uh, 
it's not easy. Um, <laughs> I think that one of the things that has to happen deliberately is more education. And this is a very hard part, and it's hard in the United States. I actually, <clears throat> when I was secretary, and I was going actually through my notes when I was writing my memoirs, <clears throat> and I can't tell you the number of pages that I had scribbled in the side, learn more about Islam. Uh, most of us know nothing about Islam. The question is, what would happen if we taught about Islam in our schools? Now, in the United States, there'd be arguments about separation of church and state, and what department would you put it in? Uh, but I do think that we need to actively learn more about each other's religions uh, in a non-prejudiced way. Easier said than done. Um, and then I also do think that there need to be more exchanges among religious leaders, but I'm not saying any of this is easy. Um, and I'm just taking a try uh, to look at some practical issues. But for me, a great part of this um, is education. Uh, and I hope that that is seen as a positive um, and not a way, because in the United States, the separation of church and state is basic, but you can't separate people from their faith. And therefore, we need to learn more about it. Can I go back and answer something that I don't think I answered sure. right on how I would vote? Um, because on the resolution. On the resolution. About because, yes. first of all, I think that people need to understand a little bit the political debate in the United States. Um, Iraq has been a very difficult issue politically. Um, most Democrats that voted for the resolution in the first place believed what, was, what they were being told by the executive branch. Uh, and that created a problem. I would like to believe my president. I have always tried to do that. Uh, it's a little hard when they're operating in a parallel reality. But, uh, <laughs> but I think... You almost said universe. Uh, but, yes. uh, <laughs> uh, Unfortunately. But, uh, uh, <laughs> but I think that's what people want. Second, um, there is a genuine issue and question that is going on in the United States is whether if you uh, are opposed to the war in Iraq, you are in effect not supporting the troops. Uh, and the question then is asked, has my son or brother or husband died for a mistake? It's very, I think our troops are truly 99% magnificent. They are the best uh, military in the world. And, um, and I have great uh, admiration for them. So one has to be really careful in the way that things are, are worded. And then also, the Democrats are constantly accused of having no understanding of national security, something which I resent. Um, and when this team came in, and they said it was the best national security team in the history of the United States, I tried not to take it personally, um, but my response to it was, yes, in the wrong decade. Um, and, um, but one of the debates that's going on, basically, is that the Democrats know nothing, and by voting against this resolution, they are going to be pictured as the cut-and-run people. And there is nobody that I know that wants to cut and run. And so um, I think I would have had to have heard how the debate was going, uh, because I don't want the Democrats to be accused of cutting and running because there is not one Democrat that wants us to fail in Iraq, not one Democrat that does not uh, understand how important the troops are, and what is going on in the political debate in the United States at the moment is ugly, and, um, I, and the division uh, in our parties is very serious, and the debate is, I think, um, verges on not being useful. With this firm and very clear statement, let's turn to the audience. Are there any questions from the audience? Uh, there, there are microphones. I don't know if anyone has a, a handheld, but they are on the side. So please, Mrs. van der Laan, parliamentary for the Dutch Social Liberal Party. Not to be mistaken for the Dutch Liberal Party. That's right. Louis van der Laan, leader of the Dutch Democratic Party. Um, I want to thank you, first of all, for inspiring whole generations of women for going into politics. I'm one of those. Thank you. 
One of the things I've always admired in you is your fight for human rights and for women's rights. That's why I wanted to ask a question about how you combine that with your plea for more involvement of religion. Because many religions, of course, have been extremely conservative, uh, have been holding back women's rights and developments, and have not been the most productive and progressive when it comes to very important issues. I'm afraid, no, let me ask it more neutrally. Isn't there a risk that you legitimize certain conservative religious convictions when you bring religious leaders and religious advisors into politics? And if you choose only the nice progressive ones, then how do you actually get the kind of advice that you need to speak to Abbas, to, uh, to speak to Hamas, to speak to Iran, and uh, the more conservative types? How do you square that? Well, I think that, um, first of all, um, I do think we need a better understanding about what the role of women in various societies is. I think we're not fully clear we have our own perceptions. I just saw a very interesting program on CNN in the five minutes that I had between things I was doing today, where there were a number of women um, from uh, Muslim countries um, or from countries where people think women don't have any role, who were showing the kind of role that they actually had. And so I've decided that one of the easiest things we all do is generalize without fully um, uh, understanding the details. I have been very interested in my study of Islam that actually if one reads the Quran, uh, given when it was written in the seventh century, um, that it is quite liberal about a lot of things about women. Uh, and uh, Muhammad was married to a businesswoman. Um, and therefore, some of it has been interpretation by the most conservative um, Muslims. And, but the same is true, of, as you pointed out, of very conservative people in, in other religions. I have the sense that there are religious leaders that are used to hold women back. Um, I happen to believe that what has to happen across the board, whatever the issue, women have to be allowed to choose their lives. Um, and I think that we should do all we can to support those within the religions that are maybe not the most progressive, but are those who understand what uh, is happening in the modern world. But it's not an easy answer. I think the thing that I have um, I disagree with a lot of the extremists in the Christian religion, uh, definitely on the issue of family planning. And it has to be a discussion, not people bombing each other uh, over it. But um, uh, I would urge, and I talk about the role of women in my book, in terms of um, understanding where Islam is coming from and to try to be supportive of those who would like to see change and more um, issues on how to recognize the role of women. But it's very hard. I'm not saying that it's easy. And what you'd have to do if you have religious people in to any meeting is to try to get a mix. I had a most interesting meeting. Th this project for me has been so different from writing my memoirs because I think the best thing happened, which is that as I wrote the book, I learned a lot. That's the best part about doing it. And I had a meeting. Uh, which was with um, Imam Faisal, who is a very respected American Imam of Kuwaiti birth, with Richard Land, who is head of the Southern Christian Baptist uh, Organization, and Rabbi David Saperstein, who's head of the Reformed Jews. And they began to have discussions among themselves about how to deal with some of these issues, and I think we need to put more of them together. But. Again, I repeat, I have no easy answers. Uh, I am just suggesting various aspects. Another question over there? Yes. Um, when the Democrats regained the White House in 2008, where do we begin to repair the damage that this current administration has done to our standing in the world? Well, I hope we regain the White House in 2008. And even though... Um, uh, I was described as working for every losing Democratic presidential candidate. I didn't say that. I only <laughs> mentioned the names. <laughs> I left it out. <laughs> uh, I will work very hard to, to get a Democrat elected, as uh, we met when <laughs> I was here working for John Kerry. Um, I think that the first thing we have to do is really get a much better assessment of America's role in the world. 
Um, and can I read something out of my book? Sure. If I can find that. You probably know where it is. Because I think that this describes a lot. Can you just... Uh, um, ours is a country of abundant resources, momentous accomplishments, and unique capabilities. We have a responsibility to lead, but as we fulfill that obligation, we should bear in mind the distinction pointed out by John Adams, that liberty, at least in the sense of free will, is God's gift, not ours. It is also morally neutral. It may be used for any purpose, whether good or ill. Democracy, by contrast, is a human creation. Its purpose is to see that liberty is directed into channels that respect the rights of all. As the world's most powerful democracy, America should help others who desire help to establish and strengthen free institutions. But in so doing, we should remember that promoting democracy is a policy, not a mission. And policies must be tested on the hard ground of diplomacy, practical politics, and respect for international norms. Our cause will not be helped if we are overly prideful or so sure of our rightness that we forget our propensity as humans to make mistakes. Though America may be exceptional, we cannot demand that exceptions be made for us. We are not above the law, nor do we have a divine calling to spread democracy any more than we have a national mission to spread Christianity. We have, in short, the right to ask, but never to insist or simply assume that God bless America. So what I would like to see with a democratic administration is some sense of proportion about what it is that America's role should be. And whether it's from reading the Bible or Spider-Man, I have the idea that to whom much is given, much is expected. And so I think we will, uh, it will help to have a democratic administration. But I think a lot of damage has been done and um, there has been a realignment going on. Um, and I have said I'm as much troubled by the unidimensional aspect of this administration's foreign, foreign policy as it's unilateral. Because while they are paying attention to Iraq, they have forgotten about everything else. And in the meantime, interestingly enough, just two days ago, there was a meeting of something called the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, where Iran was an observer, and all kinds of plans are being made of a very peculiar linkage between those who have oil and want arms, and those who have arms and want oil. And so I think the United States is going to have to look at new realignments, but I hope for sure that we understand that we need international institutions, that it is perfectly appropriate for the Deputy Secretary General to say some words of criticism about American support for the UN, and that we benefit out of being part of a multilateral world. But it'll, it's going to be hard work. I just hope we have the opportunity to do it. And we have to begin in 2006 by having a Congress, not so much that it's all democratic, but that it does what the American Congress is supposed to do according to our Constitution, which is provide the checks and balances. And this Congress has not done that. And the size of that vote uh, is one example of it, is nobody questions anything. Hmm. So I think that's what we need to do. Shift to the other side again. Yeah, Madam Secretary, I found your uh, talk very interesting. I'm an American citizen, but living here in the Netherlands for several years now. You gave a, an interesting analogy. You said that the United States was not involved, if I paraphrase correctly here, in the beginning of World War I or World War II, but came to the rescue of those that, who, had, who were unfortunately were involved and that maybe it's time for the European Union or its member nations to think about doing the same for Iraq. Uh, I would submit that uh, you, you may be right, but in thinking through that, as you said that, I thought in order for that to do it, it has to be more than just providing training to police forces and so forth. I think what it really requires is an admission on the highest levels of leadership in the United States that they were wrong, uh, that the invasion of Iraq not only cost the lives of 2,500 American troops, but thousands or tens of thousands of Iraqis, as a result of surgical strikes or, uh, or, or collateral damage, and that the United States really does need to re-engage uh, the United Nations, but from a, uh, a level of humility, having flaunted, 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 flaunted 
the UN process uh, in going to, to war with Iraq. So my question to you is, how do you see the U.S. in, in real terms re-engaging with the United Nations, and what would you like to see out of a democratic administration in 2008 in this well, regard? Well, first of all, um, I do think that there is a minimal amount of progress in some admission of mistakes. Um, this is from a president who has been convinced he's right. So I do think that there has been, to be fair, some sense that there ha mistakes have been made. Um, and, but I do think that we need to make clearer that there have been, uh, that this, I have said this was a war of choice, not of necessity. Uh, but you, we can't leave the place in the kind of chaos that it is in now or everybody is going to pay for it. I am a great supporter of the United Nations. I fully believe that the U.S., uh, well, we invented it, but that we profit by being within it. Uh, it's not easy to be the United States at the U.N., uh, and we had some of the same problems in that we had not paid all our bills uh, and our dues um, and put us in the position that when I was UN ambassador, our best friends, the British, came and delivered a line that they had waited more than 200 years to say, which is representation without taxation. Um, so we worked out a way to pay our bills, um, but I think that um, there needs to be a, uh, a rededication to the concept of a multilateral or international organization like the UN. But if you're an American, you know this. There are people in the U.S. who are terrified of the UN. They actually think it has black helicopters that swoops down in the middle of the night and steal your, steals your lawn furniture. And then there are people in the U.S. who do not like the U.N. because it's full of foreigners, which frankly can't be helped. So um, I think that we have to re-explain what the U.N. is about, why we think that the International Criminal Court is useful. Uh, and what I said in my point, we are, I do believe the U.S. is an exceptional nation. I really do. But we cannot ask for exceptions to be made for us. You are at the microphone, but, but Mr. Bolkestein honestly raised his hand first. If you speak up, this is a church, so probably we'll hear you. Uh, Madam Secretary, may I also thank you very much indeed for the talk that you gave. Um, I should like to put a question about Iran. Uh, that country is much in the news, mainly because of its nuclear ambitions. And the question therefore arises, what sort of policy we should follow? Uh, that issue, of course, is much debated. I'd like to hear your view. Now, I assume that you will say that we should negotiate with Iran. Uh, I agree. We should enter into a dialogue with the leaders of that country. But let us assume for the moment that it doesn't help that they um, make motions uh, but don't do anything, that they continue to um, build onto their program to enrich uranium, and that they do not heed the IAEA or any other advice they could get from the West or from the United States in particular. And let us even assume that in the end they will engage in, a, they will organize, they will have a nuclear test a nuclear explosion. Now, at what point should we take what measures? Because obviously, if we let the thing slip, and if it deteriorates as it may, uh, we, ha we, are in a we will be in a pretty pickle, and Israel above all. Um. Well, first of all, let me say that there's nothing simple about this issue, and it has been made more complicated uh, by the designation of the axis of evil. Because the message that came out of that is if you don't have nuclear weapons, you get invaded, and if you do have nuclear weapons, you don't get invaded. Uh, we had never invaded the Soviet Union, now Russia uh, or China not to speak of France. So uh, um, I think that uh, the message is wrong. Um, and so we are dealing with that particular problem.